Angua woke up. It was almost noon. She was in her own bed at Mrs. Cake's, and someone was knocking at the door. Hmm? she said. I don't know. Shall I ask him to go away? said a voice from around keyhole level. Angua thought quickly. The other residents had warned her about this. She waited for a cue. Oh, thanks, love. I was forgetting, said the voice. You had to pick your time with Mrs. Cake. It was difficult, living in a house run by someone whose mind was only nominally attached to the present. Mrs. Cake was a psychic. You've got your precognition switched on again, Mrs. Cake, said Angua, swinging her legs out of bed and rummaging quickly through the pile of clothes on the chair. Where'd we got to? said Mrs. Cake, still on the other side of the door. You just said, I don't know, shall I ask him to go away, Mrs. Cake? said Angua. Clothes, that was always the trouble. At least a male werewolf only had to worry about a pair of shorts and pretend he'd been on a brisk run. Right! Mrs. Cake coughed. There's a young man asking for you, she said. Who is it? said Angua. There was a moment's silence. Yes, I think that's all sorted out, said Mrs. Cake. Sorry, dear. I get terrible headaches even people don't fill in the right bits. Are you human, dear? Author's note. More usually, a landlady would ask, are you decent? But Mrs. Cake knew her lodgers. You can come in, Mrs. Cake. It wasn't much of a room. It was mainly brown. Brown oilcloth flooring, brown walls, a picture over the brown bed of a brown stag being hunted by brown dogs on a brown moorland against a sky which, contrary to established meteorological knowledge, was brown. There was a brown wardrobe. Possibly, if you fought your way through the mysterious old coats, brown, Hanging in it, you'd break through into a magical fairyland, full of talking animals and goblins. But it'd probably not be worth it. Mrs. Cake entered. She was a small, fat woman, but made up for a lack of height by wearing a huge black hat. Not the pointy witch variety, but one covered with stuffed birds, wax fruit, and other assorted decorative items, all painted black. Angua quite liked her. The rooms were clean— and brown, the rates were cheap, and Mrs. Cake had a very understanding approach to people who lived slightly unusual lives and had, for example, an aversion to garlic. Her daughter was a werewolf, and she knew all about the need for ground floor windows and doors with long handles that a paw could operate. He's got chain mail on, said Mrs. Cake. She was holding a bucket of gravel in either hand. He's got soap in his ears, too. Oh, uh, Right. I can tell him to bugger off if you like, said Mrs. Cake. That's what I always does if the wrong sort comes round, especially if they've got a steak. I can't be having that sort of thing, people messing up the hallways, waving torches and stuff. I think I know who it is, said Angua. I'll see to it. She tucked in her shirt. Pull the door to if you want to go out, Mrs. Cake called after her as she went into the hall. I'm just about to change the dirt in Mr. Winkin's coffin, on account of his back giving him trouble. It looks like gravel to me, Mrs. Cake. Orthopedic, see? Carrot was standing respectfully on the doorstep, with his helmet under his arm and a very embarrassed expression on his face. Well, said Angua, not unkindly. Ah, uh, good morning. I thought, you know, perhaps you not knowing very much about the city, really— I could, if you like, if you don't mind, not having to go on duty for a while, show you some of it? For a moment, Angua thought she'd contracted prescience from Mrs. Cake. Various futures flitted across her imagination. I haven't had breakfast, she said. They make a very good breakfast in Gimlet's Dwarf Delicatessen in Cable Street. It's lunchtime. It's breakfast time for the night watch. I am practically vegetarian. He does a soy rat. She gave in. I'll fetch my coat. Ha ha, said a voice, full of withering cynicism. She looked down. Gaspard was sitting behind Carrot, trying to glare while scratching himself furiously. Last night we chased a cat up a tree, said Gaspard. You and me, eh? We could make it. Fate has thrown us together, style of thing. Go away. Sorry, said Carrot. Not you, that dog. Carrot turned. Him? Is he bothering you now? He's a nice little chap. 
Love, love, biscuit. Carrot automatically patted his pockets. See, said Gaspode, this boy is Mr. Simple, am I right? Do they let dogs in dwarf shops? said Angua. No, said Carrot. On a hook, said Gaspode. Really? Sounds good to me, said Angua. Let's go. Vegetarian, mumbled Gaspode, limping after them. Oh my. Shut up. Sorry, said Carrot. I was just thinking aloud. Elsewhere, Vime's pillow was cold and hard. He felt it gingerly. It was cold and hard because it was not a pillow, but a table. His cheek appeared to be stuck to it, and he was not interested in speculating what with. He hadn't even managed to take his armor off, but he did manage to unstick one eye. He'd been writing in his notebook, trying to make sense of it all, and then he'd gone to sleep. What time was it? No time to look back. He traced out, Stolen from the Assassin's Guild. Gone. Leading to Hammerhawk killed. Smell of fireworks. Lump of lead. Alchemical symbols. Second body in river. A clown. Where was his red nose? Gone. He stared at the scrawled notes. I'm on the path, he thought. I don't have to know where it leads. I just have to follow. There's always a crime if you look hard enough, and the assassins are in this somewhere. Follow every lead. Check every detail. Chip, chip away. I'm hungry. He staggered to his feet and looked at his face in the cracked mirror over the basin. Events of the previous day filtered through the clogged gauze of memory. Central to all of them was the face of Lord Vetinari. Vimes grew angry just thinking about that. The cool way he told Vimes that he mustn't take an interest in the theft from... Vimes stared at his reflection. Something stung his ear and smashed the mirror. Vimes stared at the hole in the plaster, surrounded by the remains of a mirror frame. Around him, the mirror glass tinkled to the floor. Vimes stood stock still for a long moment. Then his legs, reaching the conclusion that his brain was somewhere else, threw the rest of him to the floor. There was another tinkle, and a half-bottle of bear huggers exploded on the desk. Vimes couldn't even remember buying it. He scrambled forward on hands and knees and pulled himself upright alongside the window. Images flashed through his mind. The dead dwarf. The hole in the wall. A thought seemed to start in the small of his back and spread upwards to his brain. These were lath and plaster walls, and old ones at that. You could push a finger through them with a bit of effort. As for a lump of metal... He hit the floor at the same time as a pock coincided with a hole punched through the wall on one side of the window. Plaster dust puffed into the air. His crossbow was leaning against the wall. He wasn't an expert, but hells, who was? You pointed it, and you fired it. He pulled it towards him, rolled on his back, stuck his foot in the stirrup, and hauled on the string until it clicked into place. Then he rolled back onto one knee and slotted a quarrel into the groove. A catapult. That's what it was. It had to be. Troll-sized, perhaps. Someone up on the roof of the opera house or somewhere high. Draw their fire, draw their fire. He picked up his helmet and balanced it on the end of another quarrel. The thing to do was crouch below the window and... He thought for a moment. Then he shuffled across the floor to the corner, where there was a pole with a hook on the end. Once upon a time, it had been used to open the upper windows, now long rusted shut. He balanced his helmet on one end, wedged himself into the corner, and with a certain amount of effort, moved the pole so that the helmet just showed over the window sit. Puck! Splinters flew up from a point on the floor where it would undoubtedly have severely inconvenienced anyone lying on the boards cautiously raising a decoy helmet on a stick. Vime smiled. Someone was trying to kill him, and that made him feel more alive than he had done for days and they were also slightly less intelligent than he was. This is a quality you should always pray for in your would-be murderer. He dropped the pole, picked up the crossbow, spun past the window, fired at an indistinct shape on the opera house roof opposite, as if the bow could possibly carry across that range, leapt across the room, and wrenched at the door. Something smashed into the doorframe as the door swung to behind him. 
then was down the back stairs, over the privy roof, into Knuckle Passage, up the back steps of Zorgo the Retrophrenologist, into Zorgo's operating room, and over to the window. Author's Note It works like this. Phrenology, as everyone knows, is a way of reading someone's character, aptitude, and abilities by examining the bumps and hollows on their head. Therefore, according to the kind of logical thinking that characterizes the Ankh-Morpork mind, it should be possible to mold someone's character by giving them carefully graded bumps in all the right places. You can go into a shop and order an artistic temperament with a tendency to introspection and a side order of hysteria. What you actually get is hit on the head with a selection of different size mallets, but it creates employment and keeps the money in circulation, and that's the main thing. Zorgo and his current patient looked at him curiously. Pugnant's roof was empty. Vimes turned back and met a pair of puzzled gazes. Morning, Captain Vimes, said the retrophrenologist, a hammer still upraised in one massive hand. Vimes smiled manically. Just thought, he began, and then went on. I saw an interesting rare butterfly on the roof over there. Troll and Patient stared politely past him. But there wasn't, said Vimes. He walked back to the door. Sorry to have bothered you, he said, and left. Zorgo's Patient watched him go with interest. Didn't he have a crossbow, he said. Bit odd, going after interesting rare butterflies with a crossbow. Zorgo readjusted the fit of the grid on his patient's bald head. No, no, he said. I suppose it stops him creating all these damn thunderstorms. He picked up the mallet again. Now, what were we going for today? Decisiveness, yes? Yes, well, no, maybe. Right. Zorgo took aim. Yes, he said with absolute truth. Won't hurt a bit.